Old Mortality by Sir Walter Scott, first published in 1816, narrated by Brian Stewart for the Very Nice Dear YouTube channel. Chapter 2 Summon an hundred horse by break of day to wait our pleasure at the castle gates. Douglas Under the reign of the last Stuarts, there was an anxious wish on the part of government to counteract, by every means in their power, the strict or puritanical spirit which had been the chief characteristic of the republican government, and to revive those feudal institutions which united the vassal to the liege lord and both to the crown. Frequent musters and assemblies of the people, both for military exercise and for sports and pastimes, were appointed by authority. The interference in the latter ease was impolitic, to say the least, for, as usual on such occasions, the consciences which were at first only scrupulous became confirmed in their opinions instead of giving ways to the terrors of authority and the youth of both sexes to whom the pipe and tabor in England, or the bagpipe in Scotland, would have been in themselves an irresistible temptation, were expected to set them at defiance from the proud consciousness that they were, at the same time, resisting an act of counsel. To compel men to dance and be merry by authority has rarely succeeded even on board of slave ships, where it was formerly sometimes attempted by way of inducing the wretched captives to agitate their limbs and restore the circulation, during the few minutes they were permitted to enjoy the fresh air upon deck. The rigour of the strict Calvinists increased, in proportion to the wishes of the government, that it should be relaxed. A judaical observance of the Sabbath, a supercilious condemnation of all mainly pastimes and harmless recreations, as well as of the profane custom of promiscuous dancing, that is, of men and women dancing together in the same party, for I believe they admitted that the exercise might be inoffensive if practised by the parties separately. Distinguishing those who professed a more than ordinary share of sanctity, they discouraged, as far as lay in their power, even the ancient whippenshaws, as they were termed, when the feudal array of the country was called out, and each crown vassal was required to appear with such muster of men and armour as he was bound to make by his fief, and that under high statutory penalties. The covenanters were the more jealous of those assemblies, as the lord lieutenants and sheriffs under whom they were held had instructions from the government to spare no pains which might render them agreeable to the young men who were thus summoned together, upon whom the military exercise of the morning, and the sports which usually close the evening, might naturally be supposed to have a seductive effect. The preachers and proselytes of the more rigid Presbyterians laboured, therefore, by caution, remonstrance, and authority, to diminish the attendance upon these summonses, conscious that in doing so they lessened not only the apparent but the actual strength of the government, by impeding the extension of that esprit de corps which soon unites young men who are in the habit of meeting together for manly sport or military exercise. They, therefore, exerted themselves earnestly to prevent attendance on those occasions by those who could find any possible excuse for absence, and were especially severe upon such of the hearers as mere curiosity led to be spectators, or love of exercise to be partakers, of the array and the sports which took place. Such of the gentry as acceded to these doctrines were not always, however, in a situation to be ruled by them. The commands of the law were imperative, and the Privy Council, who administered the executive power in Scotland, were severe in enforcing the statutory penalties against the crown vassals who did not appear at the periodical Wappenshaw. The landholders were compelled, therefore, to send their sons, tenants, and vassals to the rendezvous, and to the number of horses, men, and spears at which they were rated. And it frequently happened that, notwithstanding the strict charge of their elders, to return as soon as the formal inspection was over, the young men-at-arms were unable to resist the temptation of sharing in the sports which succeeded the muster, or to avoid listening to the prayers read in the churches on those occasions, and thus, in the opinion of their repining parents, meddling with the accursed thing which is an abomination in the sight of the Lord. The sheriff of the county of Lanark was holding a wappenshaw of a wild district called the Upper Ward of Clydesdale on a haw or level plain near the royal borough, the name of which is in no way essential to my story, on the morning of the 5th of May, 1679, when our narrative commences, when the musters had been made and duly reported, the young man, as was usual, were to mix in various sports, of which the chief was to shoot at the popinjay, an ancient game formerly practised with archery, but at this period with firearms. Note, the festival of the popinjay is still, I believe, practised at Maybole in Ayr. The following passage in the history of the Somerville family suggested the scenes in the text. The author of that curious manuscript thus celebrates his father's demeanour at such an assembly. 
Having now passed his infancy, in the tenth year of his age, he was by his grandfather put to the grammar school, there being then at the tune at Delsarf, a very able master that taught the grammar and fitted boys for the college. During his education in this place, they had then a custom every year to solemnize the first Sunday of May with dancing about a maypole, firing of pieces, and all manner of ravelling then in use. There being at that time few or no merchants in this petty village, to furnish necessaries for the scholar's sports, this youth resolves to provide himself elsewhere, so that he may appear with the bravest. In order to this, by the break of day he rises and goes to Hamilton, and there bestows all the money that for a long time before he had gotten from his friends, or half otherwise purchased, upon ribbons of diverse colours, a new hat and gloves. But in nothing he bestowed his money more liberally than upon gunpowder, a great quantity whereof he buys for his own use, and to supply the wants of his comrades. Thus furnished with these commodities, but an empty purse, he returns to Delserf by seven o'clock, having travelled that Sabbath morning above eight miles. Puts on his clothes and new hat, flying with ribbons of all colours, and in this equipage, with his little fusée, or fusée upon his shoulders, he marches to the churchyard, where the maypole was set up, and the solemnity of that day was to be kept. There first at the football he equalled any one that played, but in handling his piece, in charging and discharging he was so ready, and shot so near the mark, that he far surpassed all his fellow scholars, and became a teacher of that art to them before the thirteenth year of his own age. And, really, I have often admired his dexterity in this, both at the exercising of his shoulders, and when for recreation. I have gone to the gunning with him when I was but a stripling myself, and albeit that pastime was the exercise I delighted most in, yet could I never attain to any perfection comparable to him. This day's sport being over, he had the applause of all the spectators, the kindness of his fellow condisciples, and the favour of the whole inhabitants of that little village. This, the popinjay, was the figure of a bird, decked with parti-coloured feathers so as to resemble a popinjay or parrot. It was suspended to a pole and served for a mark at which the competitors discharged their fusées and carabines in rotation, at the distance of sixty or seventy paces. He whose ball brought down the mark held the proud title of Captain of the Popinjay for the remainder of the day, and was usually escorted in triumph to the most reputable change house in the neighbourhood, where the evening was closed with conviviality, conducted under his auspices, and, if he was able to sustain it, at his expense. It will, of course, be supposed that the ladies of the country assembled to witness this gallant strife, those who accepted who held the stricter tenets of Puritanism, and would therefore have deemed it criminal to afford countenance to the profane gambols of the malignants, Landau's, Bruches, or Tilbury's, there were none in those simple days. The Lord Lieutenant of the county, a personage of ducal rank, alone pretended to the magnificence of a wheel carriage, a thing covered with tarnished gilding and sculpture in shape like a vulgar picture in Noah's Ark, dragged by eight long-tailed Flanders mares, bearing eight insides and six outsides. The insides were their graces in person, two maids of honour, two children, a chaplain stuffed into a sort of lateral recess, formed by a projection at the door of the vehicle, and called, from its appearance, the boot, and an equerry to his grace, ensconced in the corresponding convenience on the opposing side. A coachman and three postillions, who wore short swords and tie wigs with three tails, had blunderbusses slung behind them, and pistols at their saddle bow conducted the equipage. On the footboard behind this moving mansion house stood, or rather hung, in triple file, six lackeys in rich liveries armed up to the teeth. The rest of the gentry, men and women, old and young, were on horseback followed by their servants, but the company, for the reasons already assigned, were rather select than numerous. Near to the enormous leathern vehicle which we have attempted to describe, vindicating her title to precedence over the untitled gentry of the country, might be seen the sober palfrey of Lady Margaret Bellenden, bearing the erect and primitive form of Lady Margaret herself, decked in those widow's weeds which the good lady had never laid aside since the execution of her husband for his adherence to Montrose. Her granddaughter, and only earthly care, the fair-haired Edith, who was generally allowed to be the prettiest lass in the upper ward, appeared beside her aged relative like spring placed close to winter. Her black Spanish jennet, which she managed with much grace, and her gay riding dress and laced side-saddle, had been anxiously prepared to set her forth to the best advantage. 
but the clustering profusion of ringlets which, escaping from under her cap, were only confined by a green ribbon from wantoning over her shoulders. Her cast of features, soft and feminine, were not without a certain expression of playful archness, which redeemed their sweetness from the charge of insipidity, sometimes brought against blondes and blue-eyed beauties. These attracted more admiration from the western youth than either the splendour of her equipments or the figure of her palfrey. The attendance of these distinguished ladies was rather inferior to their birth and fashion in those times, as it consisted only of two servants on horseback. The truth was that the good old lady had been obliged to make all her domestic servants turn out to complete the quota which her barony ought to furnish for the muster, and in which she would not for the universe have been found deficient. The old steward, who, in steel cap and jack boots, led forth her array, had, as he said, sweated blood and water in his efforts to overcome the scruples and evasions of the moorland farmers who ought to have furnished men, horse, and harness on these occasions. At last the dispute came near to an open declaration of hostilities, the incensed Episcopalian bestowing on the recusants the whole thunders of the combination, and receiving from them, in return, the denunciations of a Calvinistic excommunication. What was to be done? To punish the refractory tenants would have been easy enough. The Privy Council would readily have imposed fines and sent a troop of horse to collect them, but this would have been calling the huntsmen and hounds into the garden to kill the hare. For, said Harrison to himself, the carols have little enough to give at any rate, and if I call in the red coats to take away what little they have, how is my worshipful lady to get her rents paid at Candlemas, which is but a difficult matter to bring round even in the best of times? So he armed the fowler and the falconer, the footman and the ploughman, and the home farm, with an old drunken cavaliering butler who had served with the late Sir Richard under Montrose, and stoned the family nightly with his exploits at Kilsyth and Tipper Moor, and who was the only man of the party who had the smallest zeal for work in hand. In this manner, and by recruiting one or two latitudinarian poachers and blackfishers, Mr. Harrison completed the quota of men which fell to the share of Lady Margaret Bellenden, as life rentrix of the barony of Tillitudlam and others. But when the steward, on the morning of the eventful day, had mustered his troop door before the iron gate of the tower, the mother of Cuddy Hedderig the plume appeared, loaded with the jackboots, buff coat, and other accoutrements which had been issued forth for the service of the day, and laid them before the steward, demurely assuring him that, whether it were the colic or a qualm of conscience, she could not take upon herself to decide, but sure it was, Cuddy had been in sair straits a night, and she could not say he was muckle better this morning, the finger of heaven. She said, Was in it, and her bairn should gang on nae saccharins. Pains, penalties, and threats of dismission were denounced in vain. The mother was obstinate, and Cuddy, who underwent a domiciliary visitation for the purpose of verifying his state of body, could, or would, answer only by deep groans. Mouse, who had been on an ancient domestic in the family, was a sort of favourite with Lady Margaret, and presumed accordingly. Lady Margaret had herself set forth, and her authority could not be appealed to. In this dilemma, the good genius of the old butler suggested an expedient. He had seen money a bra callant, far less than Goose Gibby, fight brawly under Montrose. What far no attack Goose Gibby? This was a half-witted lad, of very small stature, who had a kind of charge of the poultry under the old henwife, for in a Scottish family of that day there was a wonderful substitution of labour. This urchin being sent for from the stubble field was hastily muffled in the buff coat and girded rather to than with the sword of a full-sized man. His little legs plunged into jackboots and a steel cap put upon his head, which seemed, from its size, as if it had been intended to extinguish him. Thus accoutred, he was hoisted, at his own earnest request, upon the quietest horse of the party, and, prompted and supported by old Goodyell the butler, as his front file, he passed muster tolerably enough, the sheriff not caring to examine too closely the recruits of so well-affected a person as Lady Margaret Bellenden. To the above cause it was owing that the personal retinue of Lady Margaret on this eventful day amounted only to two lackeys, with which diminished the train she would, on any other occasion, have been much ashamed to appear in public. But, for the cause of royalty, she was ready at any time to have made the most unreserved personal sacrifices. 
She had lost her husband and two promising sons in the civil wars of that unhappy period, but she had received her reward, for, on this route through the west of Scotland to meet Cromwell in the unfortunate field of Worcester, Charles the Second had actually breakfasted at the tower at Tilly Tudlam, an incident which formed, from that moment, an important era in the life of Lady Margaret, who seldom afterwards partook of that meal, either at home or abroad, without detailing the whole circumstances of the royal visit not forgetting the salutation which his majesty conferred on each side of her face, though she sometimes omitted to notice that he bestowed the same favour on two buxom serving wenches who appeared at her back, elevated for the day into the capacity of waiting gentlewomen. These instances of royal favour were decisive, and if Lady Margaret had not been a confirmed royalist already, from since a high birth, influence of education and hatred to the opposite party, through whom she had suffered such domestic calamity, the having given a breakfast to Majesty, and received the royal salute in return, were honours enough of themselves to unite her exclusively to the fortunes of the Stuarts. These were now, in all appearance, triumphant, but Lady Margaret's zeal had adhered to them through the worst of times, and was ready to sustain the same severities of fortune should their scale once more kick the beam. At present she enjoyed, in full extent, the military display of the force which stood ready to support the crown, and stifled, as well she could, the mortification she felt at the unworthy desertion of her own retainers. Many civilities passed between her ladyship and the representatives of sundry ancient loyal families who were upon the ground, by whom she was held in high reverence, and not a young man of rank passed by them in the course of the muster, but he carried his body more erect in the saddle, and threw his horse upon its haunches to display his own horsemanship and the perfect bitting of his steed to the best advantage in the eyes of Miss Edith Bellenden. But the young cavaliers, distinguished by high descent and undoubted loyalty, attracted no more attention from Edith than the laws of courtesy peremptorily demanded, and she turned an indifferent ear to the compliments with which she was addressed, most of which were little the worse for the wear, though borrowed from the nonce from the laborious and long-winded romances of Calprende and Scudieri, the mirrors in which the youth of that age delighted to dress themselves. Ere folly had thrown her ballast overboard, and it cut down her vessels at the first rate, such as the romances of Cyrus, Cleopatra, and others, into small craft, drawing as little water, or, to speak more plainly, consuming as little time as the little cockboat in which the gentle reader has deigned to embark. It was, however, the decree of fate that Miss Bellenden should not continue to evince the same equanimity till the conclusion of the day. 